I think what what really helped me realize that I am actually a two is that core motivation. I more so think that I need to earn love through what I give rather than how I perform or succeed or what I achieve. And so my three wing has been a very dear friend of mine all of my life. And it has helped push me to get positions, jobs, uh, degrees, so that I can do what I really want to do, which often has to do, like the end goal has to do with something relational in, in some helping profession or loving people in some way. And I think the biggest example has been when I composed um, my album of Enneagram songs titled Ennea Songs. I really wanted to do a project that made people feel known, that made people feel cared for and seen. And I think without my type three, I don't know that I would have gotten that project done. Hey everyone, this is Beth. And I'm Jeff. And this is your Enneagram Coach, the podcast. Hey, today we're going to continue talking about uh, wings, particularly the type 2 wings, which are type 1 and type 3. If the concept of wings is new to you, we suggest going back to episode 160 where we explain what the wings are in more detail. Uh, essentially, the wings are the two types directly next to your main type on the Enneagram symbol. For example, I am a type 6 and so my wings are 5 and 7 and Beth, she's a nine, and so her wings are type eight and type one. Yeah, exactly. So today in this episode, again, we're going to focus on type two's wings, which, like Jeff said, are one and three. Now, while your main type is the driving force behind your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors based on its core motivations, which is your core fear, desire, weakness, and longing, your wings also play a significant role in why you think and feel and behave based off of their perspective and their core motivations. You see, they see, interpret, and react to the world through their lens, their core motivations. And they're going to try to influence your main type to see it their way and to operate the way they think you should be. Mm -hmm. So just keep that in mind. That is where a lot of this is coming from. Well, because of the constant influence on our life, both big and small ways, we're going to be referring to our wings as parts of us, not just a subtype as if, you know, I'm a six with just a five wing, but these are part of us. And we talk about that in our new book, More Than Your Number. If you'll want to check that out, um, that book to really understand the concept of how we use this language and understand wings uh, in a, both a dynamic way for growth and better understanding of ourselves. So talking about our wing as parts might seem strange to you at first, but the reality is, is that we already use this language without even realizing when you're talking to others, you can feel pulled in two different directions, competing directions in our thoughts and feelings. So you might say something like, well, a part of me feels this way, but another part of me feels the desire to do this. Mm -hmm. Your wings bring their own perspectives based on their core motivations and bring up in you at times contradictory thoughts and feelings that can cause you to feel stuck, torn, or indecisive. So as you talk about type two's wings uh, with our guest today, who we'll introduce here in a few minutes, keep in mind that they're, they always remain their main type mm -hmm. with the core motivations of the type two leading the way. But you'll, what you'll hear today is how in certain situations, relationships, or experiences, their one wing and three wings will start to show up and begin influencing them and expressing some both positive and negative behaviors. Yeah, that's right. So before we introduce our guest today, I want to introduce their type, which is the type two. We call it the nurturing supporter and I want you to understand that type twos are the kind of people that really focus to ensure others around them are well cared for and loved. They are empathetic, they're optimistic, and they are hands on when it comes to caring for others. Now, what you'll see is that with a type two, they have um, specific things that they're going to focus in on, and they really do a great job on celebrating other people's lives or big moments and want that person to feel really special on those important days, which we know our, our daughter's a type two and she does a fantastic job. Now, of course, type twos aren't always perfect. They tend to take on too much, burn themselves out and neglect their own self-care. Deep down, they fear that they have to earn love. And the only way that they can receive this love is by being selfless and serving others, which can cause them to be people pleasers. They can also be possessive and insert themselves into the lives of others with advice and helpful support, but violating boundaries when it's not needed because of their pride. 
They think they know what others need and what's best for them. Now, this all comes out of their core motivations. So the type two's core fear is the fear of being rejected, unwanted, to be thought as worthless, to be thought as needy, inconsequential, indispensable, and unworthy of love. They desire to be appreciated, loved, and wanted. But they struggle with the core weakness of pride. And this is where they're denying their own needs and emotions while focusing on the needs and emotions and things of others. And what you'll see is they're going to confidently insert their helpful support in hopes that others will show and give them the appreciation that they're looking for. Now, they long to hear you are loved uh, and wanted. Now, for the type two on that pride issue, what's really interesting is type twos have a very hard time seeing their pride. In fact, for them, they're like, no, that's not pride. I'm just doing the right thing and helping others. I'm being loving, I'm being kind. And at a healthy place, that's absolutely true. They are so kind and so thoughtful and so helpful. But when they're healthy, they do it from a place that is non-intrusive. It is a place of asking, hey, would you like me to help you on that? And being okay if someone says, you know, nope, I got it. That's good. But the less healthy a two is, the more they insist that others take their helpful support or guidance or advice. And if they don't receive it, that really hurts them. And they'll kind of ratchet up and insert themselves even more because they see that there's a need and this person needs them. Um, And so that's where this pride comes in. So we have a daughter who's a type two. We do. And we've really learned a lot about type twos and kind of watching Libby um, in those healthy and unhealthy moments. But what I love about type twos is when they walk into any room, they have this uncanny superpower to feel the emotions and the needs of others. That's right. Now, this, and that can show up in a wide variety of ways. It's not just people in a room. It could be uh, music has uh, yeah. an impact on them. Also, uh, uh, even movies, uh, what they watch, they, they feel it as if it's this, this yeah. is the real thing that's actually happening in the body. And it's a beautiful thing, but it's also it's hard. Movie. That's right. I mean, when we were, I think, we were in some city. I don't remember which city. It might have been Philadelphia with her. And we are walking down just a normal, you know, downtown yes, street. Yes, I do that? remember that. That's right. And this, there was a woman in front of us running up the I hill. I didn't even notice. Okay, you didn't notice. I knew. I noticed the person walked by, but I didn't know who okay. it was or what it was. So she's running up. What it was, who they were. <laughs> yeah. They were running. She was running up the hill and she had under a coat, kind of a fancy dress on, hmm. um, kind of a cocktail dress, but then she had tennis shoes on. And she's running. Wow. So my first thought was, huh, that's interesting. All right. But as soon as she passed, Libby goes, something's not right. Like she knew it, knew it, this intuition, this like almost antenna that could sense that that there was something gone awry. And I really took note of it because that's when she was a teenager. And I thought, wow, that is so interesting. And you could see that it, it became a burden on to Libby. Because she couldn't do anything about it. She didn't know who this person was, but she could fit or feel and sense this kind of burden that was You know, one thing that's also interesting about twos that we've noticed uh, being with Libby is that um, she can be quite introverted mm. uh, and want alone time, particularly when she's around us. Now, right. I'm hoping that's not because she's avoiding us. I don't no, think that's the reason. she says it's not. <laughs> she's an introvert. But, but, but... because we're a safe place for her, yeah. like she is attempting to kind of shut that down a bit. Mm-hmm. So she's not as attuned to everything. Yeah. Because when she's with people, she's super bubbly. She's super into people. And, yeah. you know, people think, oh, she's, you know, the extrovert one. Yeah. And really she needs a lot of time to, a lot of downtime. Um, like kind of fill that tank up so that she can get back out and be with people. Yeah. So our guests today are Josephine and Sawyer, who are both certified Enneagram coaches uh, here with us at Your Enneagram Coach. So you can find them both in our coaches directory by going to myenneagramcoach.com. So thank you both for joining us. And there's a reason why I left your name out, because I just spent several minutes trying to pronounce them and getting them wrong. So Josephine, welcome. And why don't you share with everyone how you pronounce your last name, because I can't seem to get it right. Thank you. I appreciate um, your ownership to what we just tried to do the last few minutes. Um, I actually had a, my maiden last name is Chi, which was always mispronounced. And I thought whenever I get married, it'll be so much easier. But it proved to be even harder. It's Josephine Kohler, Kohler like roller. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I want to say collar yeah. or collier. Yes, I've heard all both kinds of, of them, things. Yeah. Yes, but that is not it. Well, Josephine, welcome. And Thank where you. are you joining us from? I'm in Dallas, Texas, um, in a suburb, McKinney, a little bit outside of the city. Yeah. That's awesome. And then Sawyer, which I was having trouble with your first name. And, but, uh, you, Witted is your last name. I think I'm getting that one right. Yeah, you yes. did. Yep. So, so you've been with your Enneagram coach for quite a while. I mean, how long have you been a certified coach? Yeah, I've been a certified coach for a little over two years now. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. And where are you calling in from today? Yeah, I live in the suburbs of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I live in a small town called Sellersville. It's about yeah. 45 minutes to an hour north of Philadelphia. Which, if you are watching on YouTube, you'll see behind him is the wonderful picture of the Scranton office. I thought that looked familiar. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. Wasn't there someone recently that we that had the same thing? That's him. Was it Sawyer? Yeah. Huh. What? I'm just curious. It was. It was the webinar we did, and he Mm -hmm. uh, talked about how my sister in law. He talked about how he Mm -hmm. saved. Up money, yes, to that's right. Become an Enneagram coach. Like we haven't talked to Sawyer recently. Yeah, I'm getting it right. I'm getting some at bats on your first name. That's okay. So <laughs> this is great. You're doing great. <laughs> well, we're grateful that you both decided to join us today, and so we're going to be talking about wings. And so it's common for people to talk about uh, talk most about their dominant wing, which is the wing that they notice that they use the most often. And many out there believe that they only have one wing, but um, that's not really the case. It's just in the popularity of the Enneagram, this kind of got lost. But just as a bird has both uh, two wings, uh, so do we. So today we're going to be talking about uh, both the wings for the type two so that we can recognize and be aware of how they work and function for us. So for the type two, you have a one and three wings. They're, and they're the parts of you and they play a significant role in your life. So when we discuss each wing, you can now let us know uh, one of them is more, you, you know, be sure to let us know which one you think is more dominant than the mm-hmm. other. Yeah. So we'll dive in to uh, your wing one. So type one mm-hmm. wing and the core fear of the type one, because remember the, the wings, they see life from their own perspective and they're going to try to uh, attempt to get your main type to agree with and to go along with their interpretation of things. So. The type one um, is has the core fear of being wrong, bad, evil, inappropriate, unredeemable, and corruptible. But they desire to have integrity, to be good, balanced, accurate, virtuous, and right. So you'll notice that this part of you um, is more objective, detail-oriented, logical, serious, and emotionally self-controlled. It's going to try to convince you to focus on improving the world and the lives of others while you're serving them, but kind of more in a quiet behind the scenes role. Now, this part of you is going to support your type two main part in some really healthy dynamic ways by bringing you excellent discernment, bringing you wisdom, but also helping you to set up better boundaries for yourself so that you can actually schedule time for self-care, which type twos can struggle to do. So the way the type one can assist you is helping you to actually teach others. Now, this is important, and this is kind of hard for the two, is to teach others what they need to know to actually be independent versus needing you. So uh, sometimes type twos will create dependencies because they want to know they're needed. But the type one part of you in a healthy way says, no, the better way is to actually uh, teach, train, mentor, whatever you want to call it, Um, to the other person so that they can go and do it on their own. So it's really interesting that the type one part of your heart can really assist the type two in letting go of that feeling that you need um, others to need you. Whereas right now you can actually um, impart wisdom to them, which actually is the most loving thing that you can do for them. So I would love to hear from each of you how your type one shows up in these healthy ways that can just produce that wisdom, that discipline, groundedness. Um, It allows you to still be very emotional, but the logic isn't far behind. So um, Josephine, why don't we start with you and how your type one shows up in healthy ways? Yeah, I think actually in my newer identities as a wife and a mom, the type one has become a lot more present in my daily day-to-day, really just being 
kind of like letting my responsible side show up more and my self-control so that if something panic like something panicky happens with a child or something that we're not prepared for, I'm able to impart that, I guess, um, self-controlled emotion side so that I'm able to think about how to serve them in a more uh, behind the scenes way, I would say. I mm-hmm. I feel like growing up, my mom was a type one and my dad was a type mm. two being one. So I don't think I actually had to tap, type, uh, tap into my type one-ness much. And <laughs> yeah. so now that you I'm a, groomed. Right. <laughs> I was. I had that structure and I had that freedom. So as a type two right now, that's a mom where I have to do all these things behind the scenes. I have to make sure everything mm-hmm. is orderly. Everything is responsible. All things are ready to kind of create this world for my kids in a, what I hope to have like a, like a morally uh, structured home for them, a safe space. I see my type mm-hmm. one really coming in those healthy ways. That's awesome. That's awesome. So what about you? Yeah, I, it's interesting because I am not a mom, surprisingly. Um <laughs> Um, but I'm not a parent either. And so, um, it's just cool. It's cool to hear you speak, Josephine, about how your type one shows up in that arena. Cause I can, I can imagine what that's like, uh, Mm -hmm. but I don't have that same experience. Um, and so it's just interesting. That seems really valuable to me, but my type one, I feel like it shows up as that still small voice inside of me. Uh, there's this small voice that encourages me to be true and to have integrity. I think as a two, leading with, with any type two, I can easily forsake myself and the things that are true and authentic about myself in service of, uh, I can often forsake the parts of myself that need more honoring or respect or care in sacrifice to other people and other people's needs and wants and desires because I'm trying to earn their love and affection through my sacrifice. So was there ever a time that either of you thought maybe you might be a one? Hmm. I have not. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just curious about it because it, it, we, we've heard from some people that sometimes their, um, their one surfaces or shows itself as kind of a critic part of their heart. And, it because it can be right there, particularly as they're serving people. So it's it's about doing the right thing for people. Um, so they're still serving, they're service oriented, but they're doing it because they feel like they have to or they should. Mm-hmm. Which might actually be a great segue into kind of more the unhealthy. Well, Josephine, were you about to say something? Yeah, I I definitely resonate with the fact that my type, my wing one has. Um, increased a lot in this new season and definitely Mm. um, resonated with a lot of the unhealthy traits of a type one, which is what I'm trying to learn now is how to balance those and let it be a benefit to my type, not just what I feel is a, um, like a negative maybe. And so that's what I've been uh, reflecting on. Yeah. And one of the ways in which we talk about that when uh, one, rather than just saying like, do we use one wing uh, as we get older versus another wing? that it actually shows up just differently and uh, could be a different season of right. life or a different experience, but it, it serves a purpose. Mm-hmm. And so particularly as it relates to, let's say, parenting, and there's so much hope and desire that goes into creating the environment that you long for as a, a young parent. And so it would make sense then that we rely on a resource that's going to give us a sense of direction, give us a sense of boundaries Mm -hmm. for how to provide the safest and best environment for our kids. Mm -hmm. But at times that part, that one part of our hearts can even over function because it's coming out of fear Mm -hmm. versus uh, an inner uh, kind of condition of assurance. Mm-hmm. So what does that look like when the one wing is unhealthy? Well, all parts can show up healthy and unhealthy. Um, and so as we talk about wing one's unhealthy char- characteristics, it's important to keep in mind that this part, like I mentioned before, has good intentions. And it's actually trying to help. It's trying to help this wounded part of your heart um, according to type two uh, core motivations. And so it's going to uh, this, when operating out of an unhealthier way, it's going to be quicker to judge, and perhaps condemn. Now, what that might be others, or uh, maybe even yourself, keeping yourself to high standards or others, uh, to standards, principles, and morals. 
Uh, all people have an inner critic, but for the type, the type one inner critic is just relentless. And so the one wing, if the one wing is unhealthy, you're going to feel the weight of its criticism. Uh, it can also make you feel uh, you can experience more controlling of others or yourself, insisting that you must follow uh, your advice and your principles. You also um, you'll see that maybe there's a resentment towards others. Uh, the one when the one wing is unpresent in unhealthy ways, there's a, just this internal tension uh, between your moral principles and your heart for helping people in need, regardless of how they got into the situation. And because type one struggle with the resentment, the one wing can hold up, hold some of the resentment. It can uh, it, and that'll show up in different parts of your body, uh, particularly where there's uh, some intensity, maybe clenching your che- teeth or shoulders or something. But it it will have a, a it will show up in your body. Mm. So why don't we go with start with you, Josephine? Can you give us an example when you see that your one wing shows up in maybe an unhealthy way? And then how do you relate to this part of you when it shows up? Mm. Ugh, um, my one wing shows up in an unhealthy way with my husband. <laughs> um, I think it's definitely <laughs> the inner critic in me comes out a lot with how I might not be doing enough the home or we're not creating a safe space, safe enough space, or just a lot of things that I put on myself. But as I am married, it also extends and it becomes an extension to him. And I think sometimes I feel that like if I see some things not the way I've been caring for the kids and I like it, it bla- like glares at me until I say something. And before I definitely could let those things go in general in relationships, but it's like, oh my gosh, I have to say something. And, and that's really hard for me because almost I have to like tell myself so many times mentally, like, don't say it, like, let it go, let it go, let it go. And before it wasn't that much of a, I guess, an inner tor- turmoil that I've experienced a lot in that way. And so we've definitely had to start um, figuring out what that communication looks like, because there are times the resentment does grow. And when you talked about clenching of teeth, I think seriously, since COVID happened, and I did have to kind of quit my job because that's when we did have kids and things for me, you'll see later what my wing might be is I love working. And so I think in those seasons, I've had like so many, I wake up in my teeth, like I had a dentist appointment and they had to put a mouth guard, give me a mouth guard because they've noticed teeth clenching. And I didn't even realize that tension that was happening within. And so I've seen the last few years how the one wing unhealthiness has really been coming up. And and I'm excited that now sounds, I'm able to start figuring out that balance, which is the goal. It sounds like, Josephine, that um, this one part of you, it sounds very strong. Yes. Uh, you talk about like you hear the thoughts mm-hmm. rumbling through your head and like you're trying to hold, trying to hold it mm-hmm. off. And then you just got to say something. Um, do do you feel like there's a sense that it's uncontrolled or that you don't know what to do with this part of you because there's so much energy? Yeah, I, I definitely, yes. I think I also come from a family that we, we say what's on our mind. Like I shared, my parents have a strong one in them. Yeah. And so we, we say, we talk, we just speak it out. And so I don't think it ever brought much tension. And as a background, or my husband is a nine. And so I think when I do share certain things, it becomes <laughs> yes. a conflict. And so then I give myself oh, yeah. some, I'm, I'm mad or like I, guilt, I have some guilt because I'm like, oh, wait, I'm starting to have conflict with someone that's like my best friend, but I've never had conflict like this when I shared con- like confronting thoughts. And so yeah. those are all things that then mm-hmm. continue to heighten the one in the more unhealthy way. Uh, you know, it, it, would, it would make sense in a home where you're just, voicing uh, whether it be a complaint or a criticism right or something that you don't prefer that you'd find a nine out there who provides <laughs> safety and you know maybe is uh more uh measured in how they want to address things mm-hmm. and uh make sure that they stay connected that makes a lot of sense well Sawyer what about you how do you see what's your relationship to this one part of your heart particularly as it shows up in unhealthy ways yeah so my one part was the hardest part of me, I think, to see for a while. I think because I mistook it for a lot of my two self, I can be so critical in two ways. One, towards myself. I get very critical of myself in my like perfectionistic mindset of how I care for people, um, which, newsflash, I don't 100% get it right all the time when I care, try to care for people. <laughs> um, 
it's almost like I'm a human or something. And so, <laughs> and so when I fail to care for someone, it is so funny to hear that coming from a two. <laughs> Just so, wait a minute. It's, it's that right. pride. I mean, have limitations. You know? It's that pride. Yeah. Sure. I easily forget the fact that I'm a human um, mm. and have limitations. But yeah, I can get really critical of myself when I fail to care for someone well. And it comes out in this. Uh, This intense self contempt. I think a lot of my life mm -hmm. has come out that way, wow. where I just feel so angry at myself. And yeah. the other way in which I find my one show up a lot in unhealthy ways is when I become critical and resentful of others. And specifically, mm -hmm. if I lay down a preference or something for somebody else and then I don't see anyone <laughs> else doing that or if they don't do that back, I just, I feel like I would just seethe with resentment of how could you not like clearly me sacrificing is the right thing to do and you're not doing that what's wrong with you mm -hmm. you know why why yeah. am i the one who always has to sacrifice and i'm the one who always has to give and all this martyr likeness i'm like. the one that's always exhausted mm -hmm. and see people's needs and oh, yeah. you know like isn't anyone else going to jump mm -hmm. in and help as well so i'm not exhausted oh, i yeah. mean that's that's so insightful for you to see how the inner critic is showing up both internal and external. And so one other question that um, that sort of surprises people at times is, what is this part of your heart's positive intent? Hmm. Why do you think being critical of yourself, how do, what is that, what's it trying to motivate you to do? Hmm. It's a really good question. The thing that comes to mind when I hear that is, I think it's trying to motivate me to care for people better, to show people the love of God in a way that is so mm -hmm. tangible and not just like theoretical, um, mm -hmm. in a very demonstrative way. And mm -hmm. I think the reality is all of us as broken, fallen humans can always continue to get better and better at showing each other love yeah. and caring for yeah. each other well. And so I think that one part Do you is ever feel like the energy of this one part ever helps you to take care of yourself oh yeah <laughs> um yeah i think like the principledness of it and mm -hmm. even i feel like ones are pretty good at boundaries and so yeah. when i know something is right like self-care is right you know i have to be filled first i have to be filled to overflowing not continually yeah. giving when my cup is completely dry yeah. my one kind of helps me develop a schedule and um mm. i have like a calendar where i have written in in highlighted uh activities that i have put under the category of soul care um and there are different things that i do during throughout or throughout the week and at different times each day to take care of myself and and that one really yeah. helps me do that yeah. and josephine what about you how does when you think of your oneness how does aside from just the criticalness of maybe holding resentment what, how does it, func I mean, function for you in, in a helpful way? Um, like, what's it trying to help you with as a type two? Yeah, I mean, I really enjoy listening to Sawyer's reflection because it's helping me also kind of tap into the one even more. I, I definitely also feel like I am learning what self-care looks like and the necessity for that in any identity you carry, right? Any role you might transition into and how we forget so much that that need is there for ourselves as twos and the power that ones do have in acknowledging the boundary and then being able to implement structure like that is a really great thing. And so I think um, now I'm realizing the one is helping me be a leader in my family as well. Like how do I create structure for my kids? How do I create structure for my marriage so that we can continue to clash and confront but then also with that like how do we grow together and how do we see eye to eye in certain areas? And so I think I've, I'm just constantly trying to practice saying like, hey, inner critic, like welcome and let's like talk it out together, right? And then allow myself to also then use the strengths of the one and let that be um, a part of me, yeah. yeah. You know, I was thinking recently, um, there were just, as a leader, sometimes I experience loneliness and mm -hmm. someone asked me like, have you ever looked at your loneliness? I'm like, I, we don't look at each other, but like we sit on the couch together mm. and we acknowledge one another's there, but we're not going to look at each other. 
And we all carry that with our inner critic, right? right. Like we don't, we don't want to look it in the eyes. Mm-hmm. Like it's hard enough on us. We don't want to actually sit down and uh, take a look at what's actually happening inside of us. So I'm sure for many twos, you know, your comment about, oh, I'm seeing your helpfulness mm-hmm. and we can engage and think through this together is a very compassionate, kind uh, place. And it reminds me of just Jesus mm-hmm. uh, relating to people and um, with all of their fears and concerns and just sitting with people and listening. Well, and I think also, you know, in our book, More Than Your Number, we really talk about that wounded child mm-hmm. and the beloved child and how what you guys are talking about is, yeah, you know, the wounded part of my heart, when the one shows up, it is trying to help me, but it's just, it's basically self-sabotage, right? Like it's not helpful, but the beloved part of your heart can come in and mentor, lead, direct, um, shepherd, whatever word you want to use, that part of your heart into, you know what? I need you to show up in these ways. Like, I love it when you type one wing, when you show up as organized, disciplined, when you help me to set aside time for my personal self care. Cause I know at the end of the day, that is going to overflow into the lives of others. So, keeping that in mind that it's not that we want to see the unhealthy parts. This is, you know, because this is what you guys are saying, not to see it and shame it, but to acknowledge it and to welcome it to the point where we can guide it into a healthier direction is so, so helpful. Okay. So you guys ready to dive into the three wing? Oh, yeah. Can I add what I think as an educator, yeah. Yeah. before I was an educator for about like 10 years, and I think that's when I realized like my one was used in such a healthy way, right? And so Mm. Just going back to when your identities or your roles or your transitions change, right? You have to be able to accept that you're not at the same level anymore. And so just Mm -hmm. going back to the basics of I still have the one, the strength of the one might be different now and it might be uncomfortable with where it is, but then like letting it shift into the new new role. So I I don't know, as you're talking, that just came to my mind. Yeah, Yeah. no, I think that's an excellent idea because um, these wings and other connecting paths They all function for us in different ways in different seasons of life. And so just because a one may have functioned in an unhealthy way Mm -hmm. in one particular role doesn't mean it has to be that way in other roles Mm -hmm. or that it can't change in any moment. So I I think it's it's an excellent observation. Yeah. And hopefully as people are listening to this, all the light bulbs are going off in their mind, too. And that's why we want you guys here to share your own personal stories, your aha moments, because it's only going to activate other people's minds of, oh my gosh, that's right. When I did such and such, that's when my one showed up. And that's really the benefit of what we're doing here today. All right. So let's talk about um, the type three wing. So the type three um, can kind of be a surprise to people that the two has a three wing, only in the sense that type twos are really focused on other people. And type threes can be focused on their achievements and what they're trying to get out of things. But Actually, the threes love to encourage and motivate and mentor others towards success as well. So to fully understand the type three, let's look at how uh, their core motivations show up. So the three fears being exposed or thought of as incompetent, inefficient, or worthless, they also fear um, either failing or appearing unsuccessful. So it's a lot of about appearance and what others see or don't see. But they desire to have high status, to be respected, uh, for others to admire them, and for others to see that they are successful and valuable to them. Now, what we also want to realize is your type three part is going to show up in a very outgoing, affirming, and dynamic way that is very self-assured. You know, the type threes have a lot of self-confidence because they really do nail it out of the park most of the time. And so they're very confident. They only take on things that they know that they can measure and that they can accomplish because accomplishment is so important to them. So they're not going to just swing for the fences and hope for the best. They are going to be very um, measured in their approach. Now, because they fear being a failure worthless, this adds to part of you as well as supporting others. So the type three part of your heart is like, okay, we're not just going to support people we are going to be the best at supporting people. And they're going to think of all these creative ways to connect with others, to make sure that if someone is in need, that they're going to set up certain, um, let's say maybe the the meal train or uh, babysitting or spreadsheets, whatever needs to happen to ensure that that goal gets reached. And so the three can really add to um, the benefit of the type two in this way. 
Now, some other amazing attributes that the wings can bring to you is that mapping out of goals. Now, we talked about the one. The one is definitely going to be grounded and make sure that you get things done. But this is a little bit different. They are going to, the type three is going to measure out the goals in these bite-sized ways so that you can persevere until the goal is achieved. And that's really amazing. But not only that, it's going to help you to do it in the most efficient way possible, which if you can get it done faster, then hopefully that's, hopefully in a healthy way, that's more time for you to be freed up for self-care and reflection and those kinds of things. And so what we're hoping that you'll see is that with your three part, not only are you going to get things done, you're going to get them done faster, which brings confidence into that ability to help people in the ways that you feel called to help. So I'd just love to hear from you guys. How do you see the type three part of your heart showing up in these healthy ways? Yeah. So in your guys book, um, in your new book, more than your number, you guys talk about how you named your parts. And yeah. I I found this such a helpful practice personally, as I just like oh, that's fun. relate to my part. So we're not just crazy in doing this. <laughs> well, it's actually helpful. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. No, oh, yeah. <laughs> no Jeff, you're <laughs> yeah, still a little crazy. Yeah, you're, you're, we're still crazy. <laughs> not, but, not crazy for that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, it's all awesome. no, but I I in therapy over the last couple of years, um, I've done I've done IFS therapy. And so yeah. um, kind of naming parts has been something that I've started to do. And my three part, I actually named before I realized it was my three part, I actually named him. Um, and his name is Chase. Uh-huh. Um, and uh-huh. it's it's kind of this idea of like Chase being someone's name, but also being like a verb to chase something. Right. And yes. so I have been so It's funny you say that mm-hmm. because I have a friend named Chase. And is th- and is a type three. <laughs> and is a type three. Well, there you go. It was my three. <laughs> um I all of my life I've been very ambitious. And so when I first started learning about the Enneagram about, I mean, for the first time, it was about seven years ago, I really wrestled between whether or not I was a two or a three because of how ambitious I was, am, and how I would, I mean, I love the spotlight. I love anything that has to do with perform. I have a master's degree in piano performance. Um, so I really enjoy like, yeah, being in the spotlight and, and being on stage and I think what what really helped me realize that I am actually a two is that core motivation. I I more so think that I need to earn love through what I give rather than um, how I perform or succeed or or what I achieve. And so my three wing has been a very dear friend of mine all of my life. And it has helped push me to uh, get positions, jobs, uh, degrees, different types of uh, climbing the ladder, so to speak. So that I can do what I really want to do, which often has to do, like the end goal has to do with something relational and in some helping profession or loving people in some way. And I think the biggest example that I've done this before, that I've done this recently, has been when I composed um, my album of Enneagram songs um, titled Ennea Songs. I really wanted to do a project that made people feel known, that made people feel cared for and seen. And I think without my type three, I don't know that I would have gotten that project done Um, because I needed the drive. I needed the focus. I needed the, okay, I'm going to set aside my my feelings for a little bit and just dive into this project and pump some things out Um, because I think that can be helpful sometimes. And to give you enough confidence that you've studied. Oh, yeah. um, Not just music, but you've studied the Enneagram, Mm -hmm. you know, that you can, you know, and then you also did a great job connecting with others, which twos are great and threes are great because mm-hmm. you connected with others and interviewed them. Mm-hmm. I mean, there was a, a lot. I can totally see how that three part of your heart was really assisting in yeah, that project. For sure. Well, Josephine, what about you? How do you see your three wings showing up? So when I took the test too, I got, I was in between a two and a three as well, but two was just like 90%. So I couldn't ignore that. That would definitely be at the top. And I, I resonated with all the motivations. Um, But I think when I saw those results, it made me think of some like a memory in college where this uh, like a leader mentor had prayed over me and he had seen the word competitive. And that like is such a word that resonates with our family, kind of just we're a very competitive bunch in anything, like even racing to shower first. It's kind of insane. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But like I think sometimes it's too much, right? Like the example I just gave. Uh, but you know, and so sometimes I'm, I, I was hard on myself, like, oh, being competitive isn't a good thing. Like sometimes you need to like put it down a notch. 
And when he brought that word up, it was like, you know, God sees your competitive spirit and he loves that because it's so aligned with wanting to be competitive for his kingdom. Bring people, as many people as possible in such a relational way to like win, uh, like show his salvation, like his glory, right? And so I always love that because it redefined that word for me of competitive that I said was a bad thing because everyone was like, oh, you're too competitive. But I was like, no, I, I use it in the right way. And so I think that's always stuck with me. And when I found the results, that word or that memory came to mind. Um, and so I see my three working a lot in building community. Um, another example in college was I wanted to do this 10K Longhorn run at UT. And so I got my whole fellowship to sign up for this run. And um, I wanted to like let the freshmen feel welcomed. And, you know, sometimes when you do races, you can practice together or like run together. I'm not a runner, so I'm not using the right terms. And so in the morning, I was actually going through something personal. So in the morning, I would run by myself and have my own times with God and like kind of release certain things. But then after in the afternoon, when classes were done, we would all run together and like it would be like a fun time. And so I think in that, because I was running way too much, I actually pulled a muscle and I couldn't run in the race. And so like at the end, I had like this big sign so that everybody that finished the finish line, they'd be like, Ooh, and like we would all cheer each other on. And I think at the end of that is just that a, a friend of mine had said like, you know, you have a special gift of bringing community together. And I think that happens because of like the wing three side of how you can want, like how I can see a goal, which is relational, right? Like building community, building the kingdom or whatever that may be. But then what can I do to implement that to make it an actual like success or an actual like I read wing yeah. threes like to have relational and professional success or something like that. And yeah. I see that in how I just like innately want to plan things out, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I can see, you know, what you're saying, like the the two, the relational right. warm part of the two that wants to serve and nurture, and then the three of like, okay, well, that's the goal. So how am I going to right. offer my attributes right. of, okay, let's break down that goal. Let's, let's make this, you know, an accomplishment. And what's so great is what I didn't hear from you is that when you said you got injured and you couldn't race, there was nothing negative about it. Mm -hmm. You... You were able to Did adapt. Did you feel some, some level of disappointment or frustration with it? Yeah. Thank you. For, yeah. I I was like, why, God? You know, like, I was like, oh, like, I thought this was, like, also for me and just kind of, like, I was sad about certain things. So there was a personal reason for it, right? But I think yeah. after that, I was like, okay, well, you know, other people will race. Like, how can we, like, have a great time still and stuff oh, like that? And love so, that little pivot. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I think that's why, you know, where there is resentment in certain places of my heart today, which I just have to, mm -hmm. you know, digest and navigate, like that shows that that was a really healthy time where mm -hmm. I was able to reshift and think about for core to me is relationships. And that can sometimes be a negative. Yeah. And in, when we're healthy, it's a beautiful thing because we get to highlight the community right. aspect too. Um, so no, right. I didn't right. dwell in, in resentment at that time. Yeah. And, and you know, the issue here is not, it's not an either or, right. it's a both and. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So that to feel the disappointment mm -hmm. that maybe the three part of you may be resistant to, mm -hmm. or the, dis yeah, the disappointment, the mm -hmm. sadness over something lost, but also the opportunity right. to celebrate the same thing in other people, uh, which brings the real beauty out of the two, three. Oh, absolutely. And, I mean, we've had, I think, you know, we're coming close to our trans or went past over 3 million people have, I think, taken our assessment. Wow. And the two, three is very complex. Like there are a lot of twos who think they're threes, threes yeah. who think they're twos. Yep. Um, that also happens for the type seven and eight, um, which is a hard one to discern. So it, uh, but it sounds like you both have a, a fond relationship with uh, this three part of your heart. Well, but there's another side to this three wing too, and um, and you know it well. You're both kind of I can see it in your faces. So you guys have to look at the YouTube video. A little, video to a little see bit this. of grimacing happening yes. for those that aren't oh, watching. Okay, yeah. This is that kind of enneagram world, right? Like it's like, oh man, that's interesting. Oh, oh no, that's it. not it. Yeah. I don't want to talk about that part of it. Yeah. But there are some unhealthy characteristics of the wing three. So remember that it does have positive intent. And it's trying to protect our hearts from being wounded. So mm -hmm. it's doing its best and needs you to see its good intentions in order to bring about Christ's grace and healing to this part of you. Mm -hmm. So your three wing will potentially ignore suppressed feelings, mm -hmm. convince you to focus on winning the love of others, 
by helping them and charming them into believing that you are what they need. But if someone exposes your failures or pride, which is what the two believes that you only have their best interest in mind and that they know to follow your advice, it can make you hostile, uh, vicious, and maybe even manipulative. Manipulative. If you find yourself name dropping, flattering, charming others, or drawing attention to yourself, um, maybe your three wing is activated. And if you don't feel like yourself, you could be wearing one of its masks to charm others into liking, loving, or feeling that they need you to help them with achieving something. Mm. It's interesting as I think about the three part of my heart that mm. um, I've, his name, I call him Charlie. And, uh, but it, he, like he tries to win people. And if I lose the opportunity to win people to feel secure in the relationship uh, as a type six, you know, I, I feel a little frustrated. Like, you don't want my joking around or my gift giving all the things I'm doing to try to win. You just want to make an efficient decision. Well, that that scares me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um, Josephine and uh, Sawyer, can you give us some examples of when your three wing shows up in an unhealthy way? And how do you think it's actually trying to help in that moment? So, Sawyer, why don't you talk a little bit more about Chase and um, how he shows up in an unhealthy way? Yeah. So I'm a small business owner, right? I have my own coaching business. And um, in the last four months, I've been really ramping things up and just like creating more of a social media presence and start. I'm starting a podcast and all these other things that I'm really excited about. You're doing great, Sawyer, by the way. Thanks. I, I saw that pop up. I thought, oh, that's so awesome to see that. And just taking the risk of just showing up and putting your your voice, your presence out there, I thought is it's awesome. Thanks, guys. That means a lot. <laughs> um, and I don't follow that many people, so <laughs> you better appreciate it, Sawyer. <laughs> you, you know I do, Jeff. You know I do. <laughs> Deeply. Um, try not to get like emotional on your podcast. Um, but I received that. Thank you. Uh, Beth gets emotional, but that's not the emotion she typically feels with me on the podcast. <laughs> it's more of a <laughs> emotion. That's yeah. right. I love it. It's the uh, best. When, when Beth gets feisty with you on the podcast, it's like my favorite. <laughs> um, hey, they like my you, What do you wing. mean? Do you guys notice the, tent, the marital tension of what? drama and intrigue of... Beth it's great. On the My eight wing gets spicy. <laughs> spicy. spicy. <laughs> um, so in the pursuit of all those things, there's so much that needs to get done. And and while I said before, he kind of gives me the confidence to like say, like the self-assurance of like, okay, I can do this. Um, so it is so easy as a two to have so much self-doubt. And my three comes in and says, hey, we can do this. Where... When, when I'm misaligned, right, when I'm not living from this place of I am wanted and loved, apart from what I offer or apart from what I do, Chase comes in and we start working and working and working and five o'clock rolls around and we keep working and working and um, I, I will skip meals, literally just forget about eating. Um, I will stay up too late working on something and then I sacrifice a good night's sleep and then I'm not fully present and uh, have my full energy for work the next day in my actual like 40 hour a week job. And so honestly, Chase can be a huge workaholic. And um, and that's something that I need to rather than get critical. <laughs> maybe this is where like the one ble- uh, bleeds in as well. Rather than getting critical of Chase and being frustrated that he's a workaholic, I think treating that part of me with compassion of like, hey, we can we can turn this amazing energy that we have to get all these things done, we can turn it inward and go for a walk or go to yoga or go read a book or something like that that is something more geared towards self-care and slowing down. Because then I find the next day, if I'm well-rested, I'm more productive in five hours than if I hadn't rested and then I'm working for 10 hours the next day, right? We were just talking about this yesterday. You were asking me, hey, um, even on the weekends, you don't really stop working now hey if it's a hobby that that's cool and all but um ha, have you have you noticed this it's funny to hear your tone of voice because <laughs> that's really what i'm feeling inside like i'm i'm gonna I'm step treading, into I'm your treading, world i'm and, treading lightly I'm just kind of <laughs> moseying around asking a question <laughs> seriously 
But that, that, so you're saying this, I'm like, oh, yes, it's totally my three way. I mean, not my three wing, my uh, three Enneapath mm-hmm. path that is really like, but we got to get all this done. And there's these deadlines and these goals. And... I will say it is fascinating to think about that, Beth, because mm-hmm. what, I mean, you've been getting into uh, the AI stuff. You've been getting into Gantt charts lately. Like a lot of those are about efficiencies. Well, yeah. And then tapping into my, my one wing, yeah. you know, so yeah, there's, okay, we got to get it done. Got to be efficient and grounded. But so yeah, so you're, I mean, I can totally see how that three shows up in a very yeah. significant way. I mean, way. I, I would say on weekends at times, I am fighting with the three part of my heart <laughs> to not engage because we're empty nesters. Like, and right. we work out of our home. Like, yeah, that's. Go record a podcast episode. I would say or you're go better a book. at disengaging from the three part than uh, I am. I, yeah, I'm. Though, well, though, though that might be you if, going to the nine. <laughs> he's just shutting down. Little do you know. Right. But I'm just, I right. have to shut it down. It's <laughs> right. 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 Well, well, Josephine, tell us about uh, how does the three part of your heart show up in, in, in unhealthy ways? Yeah. Um... So yeah, I keep bringing up like role changes because um, definitely when I was single, I was a wor- I would say I was a workaholic without realizing it was uh, bad for you um, because right I had a profession in education with children that were just worth it right and so like what I was up late doing was like oh but it's like changing it's going to change the trajectory of my low income students who need this education um, or. After that, it would be like serving in my youth group. So after work, I would go meet up with youth kids and just kind of like pour in life. So that relational part was always filling my cup. And so I didn't realize it was still being a workaholic, you know, in like certain ways. And so now that I am not allowed to be a workaholic just in the sense of time, right? Like time is no longer there for me as a mother of two young kids. I feel that resentment and I feel kind of like, oh, I can't, I I mentioned it earlier to you guys, I don't know if on the podcast yet or not, that I had to quit my job around COVID because we had a less than one year old. And so going back to the schools when doors were reopening wasn't an option for us. And so I tried to find some of my contract work because I was like, well, I don't know not how not to work, you know? And um, I think when we finally said like, we have, I have to quit and just kind of like, we can't balance both right now um, because my husband was in residency. A big part of my identity was gone. And I think I'm still trying to navigate what part of me wants to work because I love work, but what is it that it's that going back to that word of competitive or that word of define defining words based on society is a working mom seems more successful or seems more sacrificial or things like that. And I think that gets to me where it's like, oh, if this is a definition of success and I'm not doing motherhood and working or I'm not doing all of the things, then well, I'm not enough, you know, or, or stuff like that. And so I, I see myself wanting to create projects on my own and stuff I love, but I have to stop and ask myself, where where is my priority? Am I giving enough of my day daily to my sons? And then in the overflow, can I be doing these things that God's letting me? Or am I doing it with this desire to fit into the success definition of of the world? I don't know. That. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that totally makes sense. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's it's really, you know, interesting just to hear, you know, because you can really hear the um two types being entwined. Right. You know. And and that's why it's so important for, I think, people to understand, you know, their types. You know, we want to fully understand that, you know, your type one wing is going to show up in this uh, way to help you to be, um, in not so great ways, sometimes too upstanding and moral and perfect. And the three is going to try to um, cut corners mm-hmm. and to get things done fast in the most efficient way. But as we just talked about, it also brings out the best of who we are, right? So. Um, when we bring out that beloved part of our heart, the one is going to um, help you to be practical and to benefit others with wisdom. And the type three part is going to actually help you to achieve goals, to map it out. And so we want to acknowledge both these wings. We want to show that they're both necessary, that God gave them to us. He created us in this way. And so how can we welcome them? Mm. How can we um, also mentor and lead them into a healthier path? I think it which is really important. And so you know, we've talked about this. So there's, you know, a few steps that people can take and kind of observing their wings, because I think some people um, 
well, at least we know a lot of people that kind of chime in, you know, when they email us or um, through direct messages, they're like, well, how do I find out my wing? Yep. And so there's a few steps that you guys can do to really kind of cultivate a way of understanding your wings. And the first is just slowing down and having a lot of self-observation. Now, this is hard for, I would say, most people, not all thine types, but most people, and especially for the type two, this is really hard. The type one part of your heart is like, uh, uh-uh, we've got a list of responsibilities to do in helping people. And the three is going to chime in saying, well, we've got to accomplish all the things too, so that people know that we love them. <laughs> and so it's going to be really hard for the type two to prioritize and to carve out this time of like silence and solitude to reflect, to understand their hearts better. And so I really, really uh, strongly um, recommend that as a two, and this is going to be that hard was to the hear. kindest, really, really strongly recommend. <laughs> <laughs> I am commanding you. Now. Oh wow! Yeah, see that doesn't even fit. I know. Like it just, I know. It doesn't even. This is why we love nines. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I think she told us to do something. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, but when you guys are just on autopilot. You know, we we really want to wake ourselves up. And that's why understanding your wings is so important, because if you are not in a healthy trajectory, you need those rumble strips in your heart, those things like on the highway that alert you, that wake you up to say, oh, uh oh, I'm starting to get more critical. That inner critic of the one is really coming after me. Or, yeah, the three is trying to put on masks. I'm Mm -hmm. trying to look a certain part for people. Um, But also... We also need to put those rumble strips of how they're healthy because a lot of times we don't even look at the healthy parts of ourselves. And the reason that's important is because we want to honor God. We want to glorify him. We want to thank him. We want to um, feel the gratitude of how those parts show up. And the more we have gratitude and see them, the more we're going to start to incorporate them in our life. The more we can say, hey, yeah, I've got this thing I need to do. You know what? I can bring my one part and my three part into the mix here, and it can really assist me. So we want to cultivate some time of self-reflection, not just for self-care and nurturing ourselves, but also so that we can see when these parts are showing up, whether healthy or unhealthy ways. Great. And so when you are activated, it also helps to connect your thoughts and feelings with a story from childhood. And in these stories, you're going to find that your wings actually played a significant role Sometimes maybe the family members appreciated a wing or maybe didn't appreciate it. But your misaligned wings are trying to protect this wounded part of your heart from experiencing more harm. So always ask, what about this circumstance reminds me of the pain that I'm trying to prevent from my past? And then, you know, so lastly, as we kind of wrap things up, I just really recommend for you twos to really set us, I'm, I'm being really kind in my, you need to do this again. That's awesome that you're not noticing it. <laughs> I know. Okay, so get your one and your three it's to like help a smiling you. smiling assassin. <laughs> like, man, I've never been told to do something that I'm so receptive to. That, that's really, that's even nice. even me being, you know, having employees, like I can't tell them what oh, to do. Oh, gosh. I mean, <laughs> I'm the worst. Would you be open to doing right. this? That's totally me. That I pay you to do? <laughs> oh, it's so <laughs> true. Okay, so for type twos out there, I am highly recommending that you um, bring in your one and bring in your three to set times on your schedule right now to accomplish the goal to be self-reflective. Set aside time for yourself. Be reflective. Journal. Consider why you're doing what you're doing. Because guess what? There are needs out there all the time. People, they need this. They need that. And you're going to be pulled to exhaustion. You're going to be pulled to burnout. But when you take the time to really reflect and write these things down, you can start to see those warning signs, Um, especially if you keep saying, I'm so busy, I'm exhausted. Those are warning signs to take the time to replenish yourself. And then you're not being selfish. You are actually benefiting others by replenishing yourself because then the overflow is going to benefit others. It reminds me, and that's where Aware came from, is I I call them team meetings. Uh, And so in the morning kind of in devotional time, right. uh, I would just kind of check in with the various parts of my heart. And that could be the different attributes of my sixiness, or it could be <laughs> uh, my five, seven, nine, or three. Like, hey, what's, what are you carrying? What's, what's showing up for? What are you ruminating on? What are you trying to work out right now? Yeah. That, that Pastor Jeff, the spirit-filled self, can bring leadership and hope and assurance to. Yeah. And can I offer something real quick? 
Yeah. Sorry. No, you're good. She looked at me like... I'm looking at I you. Supposed... Be... Yes. Oh, I... <laughs> I was supposed to read next. I didn't, I didn't pick up the cue. I'm like, did I just like, speak such profound wisdom that it silenced you? <laughs> that That's my nine way of like... <laughs> yeah. Go over there. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so sorry. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So I was just going to say, I, I love the way you just presented that whole uh, practice and, and suggestions and encouragement. Uh, for twos to practice, yeah, some alone time, some self care, some solitude. I think that just as any t- for any twos who are listening to this, something that has been necessary for me to actually be able to do that to to set aside time in the morning to just read and not necessarily read my Bible, but just read, spend some time alone, have a cup of coffee. Um, sometimes I journal. Uh, what has really helped me do those things is constantly remembering the core longing that I am wanted and loved apart from what I do or give or offer. And I, I almost can't calm chase my three part or my one part who has yet to be named or my eight or my four parts. Um, I almost can't calm them down and, and listen to them and hear them out without first remembering that core longing. But that feels like a really crucial yeah. piece. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. And, you know, I think that what's so important for people to recognize is, you know, your, your inner world is being pulled into a direction, which is your core longing. Really, it's seeking out this core longing. So for you guys, it's, I, you know, you want to hear and experience you are loved. Um, you are wanted. And it's not for how you serve people. It's just you. And we keep looking for that core longing. Well, for you guys as type twos, but we all have our own core longings. We keep looking to fulfill that in lots of different ways. For you guys, it's serving, giving advice, helping, being attuned to everyone. And on one side, like we were talking, those can be wonderful things when they're healthy. But when they're unhealthy, we are demanding it from others and punishing them if they don't come through for us. Mm-hmm. When in fact, we've already had our core longing satisfied by Christ. Mm-hmm. And when we remember that, and we kind of soak that in on a daily basis, that is, it's basically drinking from a spring of living water, yeah. right? And so what happens is we can drink as much as we want, and then we're filled up, and then we can pour out of ourselves from the overflow, knowing that Christ has satisfied our core longing. So thank you for bringing that up, because that's so true and so needed. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us today, uh, Josephine and Sawyer, because it's been such a gift, and I know it's a gift to our listeners and viewers. And so thank you so much for helping us understand the Type 2's wings. So um, can you tell us where people can find you, Josephine? Uh, what about you? Where can people find out more about you? Yeah, um, you can find me at on Instagram at Kohler Commentary, spelled Kohler like roller, K-O-L-L-E-R, Commentary. Um, that's where I have a podcast. It's kind of geared towards the Korean community to kind of amplify their voices and experiences. And this season, I am embedding Enneagram questions for their types so that we can dig deeper. And my hope is really to inspire healing and a lot of just intergenerational trauma, I think, you know, within Korean culture and things that we're kind of breaking cycles from. And so that's where you can find me there. And you can also email me at kohlercommentary at gmail.com. I am an Enneagram coach. And I will just say as an Enneagram 2, it was the hardest thing to choose to invest in myself. And I am so proud of myself for investing time when I was pregnant to take this course and start clients and see that growth. Because even if I can't be a teacher in the classroom, I still get to see what talents do I have and how can I still use those in the different season I'm in. And so just encourage any other two to just invest in yourself in, in whatever way that might be. So you can find me that at colorcommentary.com so or at Kohler Commentary oh. either way. Yeah, oh, that yes, sounds that's awesome. great. Thanks, Josephine. And Sawyer, what about you? How can people find out more about? Yeah, so you can follow me on Instagram at Beyond Your Fears Coaching. I also have a website, byfcoaching.com. So pretty easy to remember. And um, I as well do coaching. I particularly love coaching individuals, especially individuals wrestling in the realm of addiction. That's where I tend to be very passionate specifically. And then also, I'm about to launch my own podcast, and it's called uh, The Stories That Make Us. And so me and my best friend, Scott, are launching this podcast, and our idea is that we want to explore the Enneagram through people's stories specifically. And we're going to do that with real-life people and then also fictional people. 
And oh, so, nice. yeah. And so, um, oftentimes fictional characters are just mirrors of real life people. Sure. And so we right. want to, sure. we're kind of devoting the whole podcast to, yeah, the stories that make us. So, yeah. Yep. That's oh, awesome. And then also, you can, sort of think- you can also find my album of music, Enia Songs, E N N E A S O N G S, anywhere that you listen to music. Yeah. That's, that's so awesome. great. I know that our coaching community really appreciated your work. So, mm-hmm. so grateful. Uh, that you persevered and completed the project. That's so awesome. Thanks. So remember, if you're interested in learning more about the Enneagram, you can visit yourenneagramcoach.com. Uh, and if you're ready to take it to the next step and uh, get a personalized Enneagram coach like Josephine and Sawyer, you can do that by uh, heading over to myenneagramcoach.com where you can find all kinds of coaches around the world. So, if, And for those of you who want to bless others by becoming a certified Enneagram coach, be sure to check out our leading certification program at yourenneagramcoach.com. Uh, our team is here to help you each step of the way. So join us in this movement of people who really want to bless others with the insights of the Enneagram. Yeah. And as always, remember that the Enneagram reveals your need for Jesus, not your need to work harder. It is the gospel that transforms us. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you in the next episode.